Hello, I am your proud superintendent, Dr. Leslie Torres Rodriguez. I am leading the crucial process of reimagining and restructuring our school district. I need you, all of you, to be significant partners in our process. We are doing this imperative work to deliver on our commitment to ensure improved student outcomes and equitable access to resources for each and every one of our beautiful and capable students. When we have completed this process together, we will hold in our hands a stronger, more equitable school district designed to serve all students well, a plan built by the entire community that will benefit the entire community. We at Hartford Public Schools are coordinating the process, but you, the community, families, students, teachers, and all of our stakeholders are the voices and the minds that must inform this work. By sharing your thoughts, you will help to co-create our district model. Our work together, which takes place over the coming months in community meetings with families, partners, and schools, will culminate in the presentation of recommendations for district models for excellence, different ways in which the district can be reimagined while ensuring the health and viability of our neighborhoods and continuing to provide access to opportunities and services for our families and students. For news about meetings and ongoing updates on our process, please visit our district website at www.hartfordschools.org. Buenas noches. El presidente de la Junta de Educación de Hartford ha llamado a orden esta reunión ordinaria de la Junta del 21 de noviembre de 2017. Damos una cálida bienvenida a todas las personas presentes y a nuestros televidentes. La Junta y la superintendente se complacen que se han unido a nosotros para celebrar logros, revisar información y tomar decisiones relacionadas con el funcionamiento efectivo de las escuelas públicas de Hartford. 
Esta es una reunión ordinaria y todos los asuntos que serán discutidos o votados en esta tarde han sido notificados como lo requiere la ley estatal. Como Junta de Educación de Hartford, estamos aquí para establecer metas, escuchar los informes de la superintendente, aprobar los presupuestos, contratos y nombramientos de personal y establecer normas para el distrito. No estamos aquí para tomar decisiones administrativas o resolver problemas individuales. La administración es la responsabilidad de la superintendente. Las reuniones mensuales de la Junta están abiertas al público. Son el momento en que la Junta lleva a cabo su tarea de gobernar el sistema escolar en un espacio público. Las reuniones regulares no son reuniones con el público. Por lo tanto, los comentarios de la audiencia se limitarán al tiempo designado para el público dirigirse a la Junta. El decoro y la cortesía son elementos importantes en reuniones públicas eficaces. Por favor, silencie sus teléfonos celulares o dispositivos de comunicación y absténgase de hablar mientras otros están hablando, ya que es mandato legal de que los procedimientos sean grabados con precisión. Es posible que tengamos que pedir orden periódicamente si el ruido interfiere con nuestras capacidades de grabación. Nos complace que se haya tomado el tiempo para esta tarde para unirse a nosotros. Estamos muy orgullosos de este sistema escolar y le damos gracias por su interés en las escuelas públicas de Hartford. Thank you, Ms. Flora. <coughs> okay, so tonight I understand that uh, many of our parents here uh, took a bus to come uh, and they especially <coughs> wanted to hear details about the workshop session. So what I'm going to do is consider taking the workshop uh, and putting it for, uh, above the regular business agenda. Uh, is there a motion? So moved. Is there so moved? Is a second? Second. All right, so moved and second. So what we're going to do is take the workshop session now, and then we'll come back to the um, business agenda. But what we'll do now is do the public comment. You want to do that? That you want to still do public comment first, and then the Yeah. Is that good? What we're going to do is vote on this motion, and then we'll do the public comment. So the public comment. Then. So all in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? All right. Um, Ms. Taylor, we are. <laughs> all right. All opposed. The ayes have it. So what we'll do now is we'll start with public comment, and then we'll move directly into the uh, workshop session. Uh, so Mrs. Glanville. Oh. Um, So, we as a board in collaboration with the superintendent and district leadership are committed to cultivating a culture of excellence at all levels of Hartford Public Schools. We thank you for taking the time to attend tonight's board meeting. We appreciate you coming out to learn more about Hartford Public Schools and for sharing your thoughts and concerns. We have established a protocol to track and respond to concerns raised. We want you to know that we take your concerns seriously, and to that end, we have staff available for immediate follow-up if follow-up is required. After you have finished speaking, a staff member will come up to you ready to take down your information. They will follow up with an, up to, with an update within 48 hours. As a reminder, you have three minutes to speak. At the two minute mark, Ms. Santiago will ring the bell, letting you know that you have one minute left. At the second bell, please wrap up your comments. Now Mr. Julio Flores will read this in Spanish. Thank you, Ms. Taylor. Nosotros, la Junta de Educación, en colaboración con la superintendente y personal del distrito, estamos comprometidos a cultivar una cultura de excelencia en todos los niveles de las escuelas públicas de Hartford. Les agradecemos que haya tomado el tiempo para asistir a la reunión de la Junta esta noche. Les agradecemos su participación y su deseo de aprender más sobre las escuelas públicas de Hartford, y también por compartir sus pensamientos y preocupaciones. Nosotros tomamos sus preocupaciones muy seriamente, y hemos establecido un protocolo para el seguimiento y respuesta a inquietudes planteadas. Tenemos personal disponible para seguimiento inmediato para los casos que lo requieren. Una vez que usted haya terminado de hablar, un miembro del personal estará disponible para tomar su información. Esa persona investigará su caso y se comunicará con usted dentro de 48 horas. Le recordamos que tienen tres minutos para hablar. Cuando han pasado dos minutos, la señorita Santiago sonará el timbre dejándole saber que le queda un minuto. 
Al segundo sonido, por favor, termine sus comentarios. Thank you so much. First, we have Hyacinth Kenny. As always, I always say, thank you all for serving. So I'm Hyacinth Yeni, and I'm a resident of the city. And I'm here because I would like to know, when is the school board, superintendent, willing to sit and make that hard decision about closing some of these schools that we have in this city? You know, I've talked about when we were building all these schools over the years, and I always say, why are we building so many schools? But again, it all boils down to Hartford cannot say no, because, oh yeah, the state will pay 100%. Well, you know what? We don't need 40-something school in the city, all right? We need, to do, we need to make the hard choice, all right? Nobody up there wants to make it, but we're going to have to because we can't afford to keep all these schools open, all right? We don't have enough kids to go around in these buildings. We don't have enough money to run these buildings. So let's get real, guys. We have to make that decision, all right? And if you want me to help you make that decision, I can help you, all right? Okay, so don't be sitting out there because you may not want to hurt somebody's feeling Let's face it, when you don't have the money to buy certain things in your home, you're going to have to cut back. Okay, so we're going to have to cut back. We need quality schools. We don't need to have 40-something schools to have quality. All right? It's what in the building that matters. And if you don't have the resource to make things happen in those buildings, it makes no difference. As I said before, I am very much concerned about the fact that 70% of our children are still not getting it. And superintendent, I'm hoping when these big contract comes up about, you know, somebody wants to do a program in your school and do all that, it's going to be something that's going to help our young people learn to read and write and get it where they can achieve. And at the end of the day, our, our report won't look this bad. This bad, it really is bad. It's not good for us, okay? And we need to do something about it. We can't just continue to overlook it anymore. Make a school, a one good school every, I said once a year or maybe every six months. Put all the resources in these buildings so we can have a good quality school. So we can keep our kids in Hartford. We don't want to be left with all the kids that may have issues and stuff like that. As I always say, Education starts at home, and none of you up there want to talk about our parents need to be involved. Our children need to learn to start at home, okay? When you get them prepared to go to school, don't expect, okay, I send my kids to school so everything should be fine. Parent involvement is critical to have successful children. Parents need to teach their children values, expectations. We must talk to our children about expectation. Don't expect teachers to do everything out there. Teaching is a partnership, and we need to make sure that we are encouraging that partnership between parents and children. Not lip service, but real. All right, that's how we're gonna get the job done. Have a good evening and have a good Thanksgiving. Oh, I don't know. Thank you. Next we have David Claudio. Good afternoon. I've been three years fighting for one situation that happened with my son. My son is in special ed education. And he came to this school with a power professional, one on one. When he got to this school, what happened that they took him out of one one without concern, without having a PPT, making sure that I did not agree with that. 
after three years with this fight, I will go to downtown, I had couples PPTs with this situation. My son is a runner. They put him with another runner on the, uh, with the para, professional. I said, wait a minute, and his, and his IP says that he needs a one-one para. When I come to the school, they say they had no money for having a one-one para. I went downtown, I talked to people downtown. They told me that there's no money, but at the way the, the proof, we're saying that he need, it says in this school doesn't accept one-on-one parents. My son, I got a couple of complaints already. Into the reports, I brought two with me right now. Last year he had five times he left the schools and nobody trying to do nothing about that, his safety. That's why I'm here to make sure what we could do about it because I've been three years already fighting all this without you know, no support. I went downtown, like I said, I want to talk to the superintendent, I don't know who she is. I want to make an appointment to tell me I don't have no right to talk to her. That's why I just go every time, any problem I got, I go to downtown with that. I don't know what else I could do to, for my son's safety in the school. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Bianca Pinkney Rain, and I have two children at Montessori Magnet School. And I am here um, this evening as the chairperson of school consolidation and closings for the Hartford Parent Leadership Coalition. The coalition is made up of um, PTO presidents and SGC parent members across Hartford Public Schools. Our next um, Hartford Parent um, Coalition meeting will be held November 29th at the New Visions, 85 Signey Street in Hartford. And this is a forum where the superintendent staff will be coming and talking to our leadership about the SBAC scores. This is a follow-up on my last conversation that I had here at the board meeting and I'm calling to thank the superintendent for taking us seriously and meeting us where we are so that we can be partnerships in this work. Thank you. Thank you. Jerry Clasis, Clavis. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. I'm Jerry Clavis from Hartford, Connecticut. I'm here on behalf of the Lewis and Jacob L. Fox Foundation. I'm happy to announce that. The application season for next year's scholarships is open until December 15th. So I just wanted to alert you and the public to encourage your Hartford Public Schools high school seniors to apply for the scholarship. This is the 80th year that the foundation has been granting scholarships. Last year, 12 scholars were awarded uh, college scholarships of up to $14,500. So it's a prestigious scholarship, it's rigorous to apply for, but I think that you would agree it's well worth it. And people can get more information by visiting foxscholars.info. <clears throat> We've awarded over 1,000 Hartford scholarships in the past 80 years. So there are many of us out in the community and around the country um, looking to carry on the goodwill of Lewis Fox in honor of his father's memory. And I'm happy to answer any questions if you have any for me right now. Unfortunately, we can't. We have to listen, so. But Thank we you. have questions later. We'll, we'll get back to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have Alyssa Peterson. Okay, I'm going to fall through 
this chair and you're going to be laughing. No falling. <laughs> Good evening, Alyssa Peterson. Uh, thank you for allowing me to uh, address you. Um, last month, you recall, I came and I spoke about the issue of branch libraries in the schools and how important it was given that we had uh, the projected branch library closings. I was very impressed. I want to go on record. I was assigned two people within minutes, I think, after I spoke, and that was assistant superintendent, I don't know the titles, uh, Colon Rivas and uh, Michelle Pulick. So I hope I have their titles correct, otherwise I just gave you a promotion. Um, but anyways, I was, I was so pleased. I, I had emails right away. We had meetings scheduled. It took us a while to get the meetings or phone meetings coordinated. But I was so delighted with the follow-up. The production of those discussions was even more delightful in that I learned what basically people at City Hall don't know that the school system is in the branches, that there is this wonderful program called Boundless. And I really believe that the board, this is something that came under your tenure, you need to do a better job of announcing what it does, how you know, all of the elements of the program, that it was your idea, that it was, uh, you did work with the last uh, librarian, uh, Matt Poland, um, the, uh, here's a plug, folks. The YouTube uh, video is excellent, excellent. The article in the Hartford Current, that was great. I did some other reading, but, but very specifically, it talks about what a, a, a branch library can be in the community within a school. The drawings are on there, the interactions on there. You had reports from your Goodwin librarian, no less, about the gains. This is the kind of partnership we need between the schools and, the, and City Hall. And, and, and City Hall needs to learn this better about this partnership going on. So very simply, I applaud you. Um, we need to do more. We need to work together to try and, and get Rawson going to, to accommodate the Blue Hills. I think that's number one. Number two, Mark Twain closings unacceptable. But, that will come as we move down the road. And, and to that end, I've been discussing with a lot of people an idea um, to bring what the city of New Haven has, where the city of New Haven operates its libraries. They have trustees or a board, but it's a department of, of City Hall. It's department of the library. So within the next week or two, my, um, through Dr. Deutsch, I'm introducing with some others uh, an ordinance to take over the library. Um, and if we don't succeed, if our city uh, hall doesn't agree with us, we're just going to put it on the referendum next year, along with the question of having five elected Board of Ed people versus four. Uh, there'll be a couple other questions, but I'm sure these are winner arguments. But again, and I'd like to have, the reason why I mention that tonight is I'd like to have two appointed members of, these trust, of this new city library board, trustees, um, to be from the Board of Ed appointments. So I, I know I have, the, the bell is rung, but I'm doing all of this through the state statutes. All of this is in the state statutes. We can do it. It's legally proven. The city of New Haven's done it. It's time to make our public libraries public, publicly run, con their budgets controlled truly by, uh, by City Hall, by our council. And more specifically, I think it will engender a much better partnership between uh, uh, the city and the schools in our branches. And I thank you again. I look forward, I have my sec, we're gonna have another meeting scheduled with uh, Dr. Pulick and uh, I'm looking forward to learning more. But that's one thing you've done right. I was so impressed. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Natalie Longley. Good evening to the Board of Education and everyone else present. Um, I am Natalie Langlais. Um, co-chair of the SGC at the Dr. Martin Luther King Elementary School. Um, 
Today I am here to appeal to the Board of Education as we go forward with school consolidations and closures. Um, it is a tough task we have at hand and um, I am really appealing to the Board to present to the community a united front in decision making, which is going to impact the entire community. I know many feathers are going to be ruffled, and um, I do believe in you. <laughs> I believe in all of you that we can get the job done. Um, some of the things that really matter to us in the community, of course, we, we have said before, but I would like to reiterate. Um, Starting off a bit differently, you know, we would like to see a system which is aware of the trauma that our community faces and the impact it has on the lives of um, children and the family, and as such, be more accommodating when you're making decisions. Um, be mindful of the socio-economic challenges that the minority community face when you're making these decisions because it's really gonna it's really gonna throw lives, styles into upheavals and such like that. Um, we know some of the things that we would like to see. We wanna see robust curriculum. We wanna see character building after school programs. I wanna see our kids excited to go to school because they're passing their exams and they have good grades. Um, I would like in the future parents to be able to say with pride, my son or my daughter is a product of the Hartford Public School System. I would like to be able to say that the Board of Ed did a phenomenal job in turning things around. So I am just here to commend the um, extensive community outreach that I have been witnessing and to encourage you all um, just know the, our parents are looking to you for leadership and guidance, and we are really putting our faith in you as a board. Thank you so much for all that you are doing, and enjoy your Thanksgiving. Thank you. Thank you. That, that, that concludes the public comment. All right, well, thank you. All right, so. We are going to move into the workshop portion of the meeting, um, and I just want to remind board members that actually this portion you can talk and engage and ask questions. Um, so I will turn it over to the superintendent, um, and we can start a workshop. Madam Superintendent. Thank you. Uh, thank you everyone for coming and joining us tonight. Uh, thank you for all the comments uh, as well as your superintendent as a proud parent of a child attending our schools, as a resident of Hartford, and as a product of this wonderful community and the school system, I share your hopes and I share your dreams. Uh, and we have a shared commitment, as you heard tonight, uh, for all of our students, that is the driving force behind this crucial process that I am leading right alongside with you uh, to reimagine and restructure our school district into a group of schools, a network of schools that provides high quality experiences and opportunities for all of our students. And so the imperative is here before us, uh, the future of our students, <coughs> of our families, um, of Hartford, depend on our schools. I'm going to ask that you follow along. My presentation, um, Tonight is um, around our district model of excellence, and I'm going to review our district priorities and strategies to guide and ground uh, my presentation. I'm also going to review uh, the district model of excellence, the planning process. Some of you may not be aware of what that process have, has entailed and will continue to entail. And I will highlight uh, uh, the input and the data gathering phase, what we have heard, what we have learned, and of course, I will share um, our non-negotiables and the implications that are going to inform the second part of the presentation, which will happen uh, in December, that um, will entail recommendations. I'm going to begin uh, by sharing our uh, priorities so that 
uh, they can ground uh, our work moving forward. We know that ultimately where we want to be in terms of an organization is one that is uh, focused on excellence. Uh, making sure that we focus on our four priorities, which include teaching and learning. We heard uh, throughout the engagement process that we want to make sure that there's excellence in teaching and learning in all of our schools, in all of our classrooms. That remains a priority for us. We have <coughs> elevated family and community partnerships, uh, making sure that everything we do entails uh, the partnership of our family and our community. And uh, that can be seen throughout the engagement process that we have in, uh, engaged in um, as we begin to uh, lift the priorities to reimagine the district. The other two priorities uh, are new priorities for us uh, this year. One is around operational effectiveness. And uh, basically what that calls is for us to ensure that all of our resources that we have are um, being used in the most efficient way possible. We cannot be wasteful. You know, as a, as a principal, I always talk to teachers and students about the fact that we can't be wasteful with our learning, right? Every minute counts. Well, we can't be wasteful with, with, our, with our resources, right? Every resource counts. Um, and so that speaks to our operational um, effectiveness. And our fourth priority is around systemic accountability, and that is making sure that we deliver at all levels of the organization, that we deliver on what it is that we said we were going to do, that we deliver on our commitment around high quality teaching and learning, that we hold ourselves accountable uh, to improving in efforts to keep our children safe, that we deliver on our efforts to maintain positive uh, relationships and productive and learning relationships for, 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 with our community. And so those are our priorities that, gonna, that are gonna continue to guide um, us as a district. And so as part of one of those priorities is our district model of excellence. And what that is, is our commitment to creating the network of excellent schools to provide um, equally uh, for all of our students high quality experiences. And throughout uh, the process, we um, set out to identify three things. One is to identify the current needs and the resources in our community to understand what your priorities are, your priorities as our community, and then to offer different ways in which the district can be reimagined. Many of you have seen this graphic. This is an overview of our process. Um, we currently are in uh, the end of our input and data gathering phase, and then we're gonna shift toward feedback phase after um, I make presentations to the board and recommendations next, next time we come together. During the input and data gathering uh, phase, which is the process in which we're in now, an essential component of this process is uh, to develop the, the model by gathering in <coughs> input from the community on what it is that everyone thinks makes a great school. And through the community-based meetings, school-based meetings, online uh, feedback forums, uh, a dedicated phone line, a board representation and, and engagement, uh, engagement with our teachers, with our staff, with our businesses, our community partners. Um, everyone has lent their voices um, and, and their minds to share the vision for Hartford Public Schools. And so uh, in terms of uh, the goal of this initial communications and engagement efforts, uh, we gather input from, from many stakeholders so that we can collectively understand the needs, the priorities, and the, and the interests. have heard from many uh, stakeholders and the next few slides that I'm going to share um, highlight some of what it is that we have heard from many different uh, groups. Uh, these were your voices um, as you consider the hopes and, and dreams and discuss uh, challenges and concerns. And so these are uh, board, if you remember, um, some of these from our uh, retreats, given that we wanted to make sure that we, I, um, heard what you all uh, had in terms of hopes and dreams for your respective communities and your respective constituents. The Board of Ed also shared uh, <coughs> what they heard from families and their community. Uh, of course, um, I'm sharing here some of, some of the actual quotes uh, 
making sure that children have uh, the ability to make choices, high expectations and cultural competence from all educators, making sure that our schools, all of our schools are safe and affirming places for everyone. Schools should model a family. Schools should teach children how to think, not what to think. I want my kids to do better than I did in school so that they can have a better quality of life. These were your, your, some of your quotes. Principals, our leaders, our school-based leaders had a lot to say. We made sure that we wanted to engage them in the process throughout. So every monthly meeting that we have, every monthly uh, gathering that we have with our principals, we certainly not only leverage their thinking and their feedback, they have also informed um, what it is that we should be considering throughout the transition process that's coming up ahead. And so I wanted to make sure that I also shared some of their voices uh, here tonight. Everything that we do has to promote consistent, high quality instruction. So you're beginning to hear a lot of the themes. There are similar themes from all of our, our constituents, all of our groups. More instructional time for our students. Collaboration time for our <coughs> teachers, for our adults. And all students having access. All students meaning students with special needs, students that need enrichment, our English learners, having access to the same types of opportunities, programs, and resources. Facilities should be equitable throughout the city. Putting staffing needs first. Schools should be the centerpieces of our communities. I can go on and on and on, but as you can hear, uh, whether it is our principals or the Board of Education um, thoughts and dreams, there are a lot of similarities. We certainly made sure that parent voice was at the center of this process as well. Our parents want great schools where they meet individual student needs. Value is placed on developing the entire child, not just subjects that are measured through standardized tests. Great administrators and teachers, meeting the needs that are the social and emotional needs of our students. Individualized learning, equitable access. Our teachers, our teachers and staff also is, are, are informing uh, our thinking throughout this process. Great school is made up of a committed group of teachers and staff that are honored and valued by the district. Great schools are sensitive and reflective of the community that they serve. Each child is an individual child. Access to caring staff. Safe and updated buildings. Access to technology. And of course, we heard from our students, who by the way, took leadership also throughout this process in developing questions, and identifying trends and themes from their colleagues, whether it was our student senate or students throughout our schools. <laughs> students want scholarships because they have aspirations to be prepared to attend college and to persist through college. Sports and clubs matter to our students. They want more access to that. Teams of teachers who can coach projects. The whole team comes together to create. Language is something that has to be considered. 
AP or college courses for our students so that they can be prepared. This is what our students are asking for. When I, when I met with the student council, um, you know, our students, were, they weren't asking for technology. Our students said, superintendent, we want counselors, more counselors so that they can guide us through the college going process. Our students, scholarship opportunities. We want to play sports, superintendent. We want more AP classes, superintendent. That is what our students are asking for. So that tells us our students have drive, they need the resources and they need the adults all around them to help them throughout the process. The community spoke. Access to opportunities like AP classes and external partnerships and internships for our students. Many resources in our community are available for our students. Equal access to facilities. More specials like art and music. PE in all schools. The community investments, the resources in our community should be aligned for greater impact. Wrap around supports and services for our students. High expectations for our students. Also as part of the input and the data gathering of phase and the comprehensive study, and in alignment with Board of Education policy, a comprehensive study of the district and the schools was conducted. A comprehensive study is designed to establish a common fact base, and that's to tell us where our current state is in terms of facilities, programs, and the resources, as well as the practices, the performance, the academic performance of our students and enrollment. The comprehensive study was informed by existing data and reports, as well as data and information uh, and input collected from all of our stakeholders. Uh, the executive summary was presented on November 8th to the Board of Education. I will go over some of the slides that were presented on November 8th, and I will, uh, by the end of the day tomorrow, submit to you a, um, a written uh, comprehensive support. And then that will also be published for and available for uh, everyone to, uh, to read. Our comprehensive study uh, confirms that our district works um, in a very challenging context that I've already shared with, with all of you. We have deep student needs. Our students have many needs that we have to uh, tend to. Persistent low performance. We have to call it, we have to, and I'm the superintendent, right? But I'm gonna call it like it is because we, as one of our priorities, is systemic accountability. And so we have to hold ourselves accountable. And so we have persistent low enrollment, uh, low performance, which is something that we're gonna to work towards improving. Uh, we also have a declining enrollment, and of course, our fiscal challenges, budget uh, challenges. Hartford Public Schools serves one of the highest need student populations in the state of Connecticut. Compared to surrounding districts, Connecticut peer urban centers, so for example, our Bridgeport, our Waterbury, our New Haven, those are our peer urban centers. Um, overall in Connecticut, Hartford does serve the highest percentage of students that are free and reduced lunch students, English learners, and students with special needs. With regard to enrollment, over the past four years, our neighborhood school enrollment has decreased by 15%, while the enrollment in our magnet schools has, has remained consistent. The majority of our schools are neighborhood schools. The majority of our neighborhood schools have 85% more students in poverty. <laughs> All of these elements put together, right, presents our students uh, with, with higher needs, which we have to take into account when we uh, develop programming, which also impacts resources. 
when we talk and think through um, the average school size, in Hartford we currently operate about 34% more schools when we are compared to our peer districts. So those districts in, in Connecticut that have about the same amount of enrollment as Hartford, we operate 34% more schools. So think about that, right? We're working harder. We're using more of our resources. Our resources are now spread too thin. We also have more schools with low enrollment less than 350 students in elementary schools. And some of our schools, elementary schools, have less than 350 students. We also have schools, uh, within those schools, smaller smaller grade sizes. So in elementary schools, some, some grades have less than 45 students in a grade. So low enrollment, low use of the facility, and the small grade sizes, it creates design challenges. When I talk about design challenges, that's the way schools are organized. Small schools have cost implications. That means that it's, it's, it's more expensive to run the schools. Lower grade sizes create wide variation on class size with very small, we either have small grade sizes or we have larger class sizes. There's also less funding flexibility so that we can offer a variety of resources based on the need and on the school type. Small schools also have design implications. It's harder to organize a broad range of programming. With this less flexibility in the staffing that we have, it's harder to organize resources, our teachers, our staff, in an effective way in order to support small groups and interventions. And as you can recall a few slides before, many of our students need small groups and interventions. Teacher teams that share content are smaller or they don't exist. And so this has a barrier, this creates a barrier for, for our teachers to learn from and with each other. They don't necessarily have that opportunity. And that's important, right? We want to make sure that each and every teacher, right, that is standing in front of our students delivering high quality instruction, we want to commit to making sure that we continue to build the capacity of our teachers. That requires resources. It's a challenge for us to do that in smaller schools. We want to make sure that we provide equitable access for all of our students. So as we assess equitable access to high quality schools, we have to consider also which schools are, are moving the needle, right? increasing student performance and closing achievement gaps. At the end of the day, we have to make sure that all of our students are performing at high levels. So when we look at this map, with regard to English language arts and the growth in elementary and middle schools, the size of the circle represents growth. So the larger the circle, that means there's been more growth in English language arts. The neighborhood schools are shown in red and the magnet schools are shown in the blue circles. So as, as you can see, the map shows a number of neighborhood schools that lack access to seats in higher growth schools. This slide uh, represents the uh, enrollment and utilization. So the darker, the darker the green, the more use the facility or the school has. And then the larger, the white circles, the empty circles, the higher the enrollment. Could 
throughout this process, I wanted to make sure that we also consider um, and take a look at neighborhood access to high schools. This map um, clearly shows that we currently have few neighborhood school, neighborhood high school seats uh, available in North Hartford. So despite all of those challenges, despite the fact that uh, we have high concentration of student needs, uh, despite the fact that some of our schools are low enrolled and that our student enrollment continues to decline, many of um, the data calls into question what the community resource are, right? That's a question that we have. How can we leverage community-based resources? The data also suggests that we have vast uh, community resources, and this map shows an expansive number of youth-focused community resources that are around our schools. All of the, the dark, small dots represent a um, community-based resource, youth community resource. That's a positive for us. Many of those uh, resources have an academic focus for youth and their families as well, which is something that we have to consider given that we continue through here throughout the process uh, that we should uh, make sure that the communities and the resources in the communities are completely in alignment with the needs of our students and our uh, families. So I'm going to shift uh, now to um, talking about our, our non-negotiables with the input from the board, the school, families, and the community over the last few months. It helped to uh, define the guiding principles. These are the priorities of our community. Great teaching and learning in every school. Making sure that schools have the resources, the staff, right, our teachers and other support staff and district support that they need to invest in the essentials of great teaching and learning. So, high quality instruction, developmentally designed programming, making sure that they're aligned to standards because we want rigor. We want rigor in our classrooms. Quality curriculum and assessments. A whole student approach, right? Academic, the health needs, social and emotional needs, want our students to feel connected, structures for individualized time and attention for our students. Great teaching and learning also means that we have to make sure that our adults experience professional learning that's ongoing and that's connected to feedback and coaching so that they can improve on practice. And in adult culture, of collaboration, continuous improvement, and shared accountability. And we also have to aggressively attract, develop, and then be able to retain great teachers and leaders. Another guiding principle is around expanding family and community partnerships. This was an emerging trend throughout all of the conversations for all of the groups making sure that we utilize the community resources in a way to improve the academic outcomes for our students. Safe and equitable access to great schools and pathways. Making sure that our students have safe, convenient, and equitable access to schools, regardless of the neighborhood in which they're from. So we have to have safe and welcoming schools clear and logical pathways for our students and their families. Making sure that those pathways provide a variety of choices, configuration, and program options. And lastly, the last guiding principle is around fiscal sustainability. Making sure that we're able to be structurally and financially sustainable. That we're not here in two years from now saying, oh my, how is it that we're going to fund our programming? Making sure that long term, we could be rest, resting, rest assured to say, okay, 
We have designed a school district in which we're going to be able to sustain and support on behalf of our students. So that means that we have to look for external funding and partnerships. We have to monitor, monitor our impact, make sure that we adjust our cost structures, right? making sure that we look at enrollment and our revenue, and we want to maximize the resources. So based on what I heard from the community, those were our non-negotiables. Those are our guiding principles that are formed, these non-negotiables for every student in every school. So at the elementary level, what I've done here is um, I've separated the non-negotiables into uh, programmatic non-negotiables, practice non-negotiables, those speak to our adult practices, and what I'm calling operational non-negotiables, how we operate, how we do things around here. These are in alignment with those four guiding principles. So in terms of programmatic non-negotiables, at the elementary level, we have to make sure that we guarantee that every student has access to what I'm calling intense literacy and numeracy instruction so that they can develop those broad literacy skills that they need to read, read, write, listen, speak, think, and ultimately lead in their communities. At the middle school level, have middle school programming because we have to ensure that our young adolescents experience developmentally appropriate, challenging, and empowering relevant learning that not only motivates but inspires our middle school students. Because remember, we know that not only in Hartford but nationally, the trend tells us the data that from eighth grade to ninth grade, many of our students are disengaged. We lose many of our students. So we have to work backwards and make sure that we strengthen our middle school programming. At the high school level, a non-negotiable is uh, the provision of college preparatory and career development supports. This includes dual enrollment opportunities, early college experiences, AP courses, campus-based experiences, but we wanna make sure that each and every high school student has access to college prep and or career development opportunities as non-negotiables for us. In terms of our practice, practice non-negotiables. Designing every school to serve as a community school. Designing every school to serve as a community school. And resource-rich hubs, right? hubs, centers, to their own communities. So this requires that we leverage partnerships, partners, families, every school and every student, so that they can benefit from the expertise in their own community. Not only throughout the school day, before and after the school day. Practice non-negotiable, collaboration. Guaranteeing that adult learning culture means that we build not only a structure, but a culture of adult learning and professional practices that allow the adults to learn from and with each other. We also need to build a, uh, a framework for partnerships so that we can ensure that our partnerships support and serve the needs of the schools and the students. Great resources, we saw the slide, many resources throughout the city. But we have to make sure that we're intentional and laser focused on improving student outcomes based on the needs and then based on those community resources that are available for our students. How we operate our district and our schools matters. We have non-negotiables there as well. Guaranteeing that we operate our schools at a financially healthy and strategic capacity. We can no longer have schools that are operating half empty. That has to be a non-negotiable moving forward. We need to right size our district so that we can use the resources in the best way possible so that our students can thrive. And of course, making sure that we design the district so that there are 
coherent and logical pathway so that things make sense in terms of choice for our families. That includes our grade configurations and the progression for our families and students. And lastly, we have to ensure that there's access. Every student has access to a high quality seat and adequate resources uh, year round. Not just during the regular school day. Think about that. In and out of school. So that's a, a summary of not only the guiding principles, but what I'm recommending the non-negotiables to be as a result of the engagement and the input that we have heard moving forward. They are going to inform the guiding principles and the non-negotiables are going to uh, inform uh, the recommendations that I will be putting before you on December uh, 19th. I'm of course asking the community to engage and provide input, ongoing input throughout the process. I will present in December the proposals for how our district can be reimagined to realize our goal, our shared goal of improving our student outcomes. The recommendations are not only going to include recommendations for school closures, consolidation, and co-locations. They will include all of those informed by the comprehensive study and community input, and also recommendations uh, for transitions, transition phasing, and recommendations along with cost analysis and considerations around trade-offs and risks. So I want to make sure that while I'm making recommendations, we also think through what the trade-offs are going to be for making the investments that we're going to make and um, the cost implications that, that that will be here before us as well. In January, of course, you will um, consider the models for excellence, consider the voices that you have heard, and decide what the model will serve, what the model will be that will serve our students, families, and the Harper community best. I, so that concludes my presentation. I do have um, one last um, message that I'd like to um, say to you all as a board. So we have some challenging times ahead of us and we will have many tough conversations. And as a board, you will make difficult decisions. And when I go through, so personally speaking, when I go through uh, challenging times, I always try to use a lens of, of gratitude to put the situation into perspective so as the superintendent, I want to let um, each and every one of you know that I am deeply grateful uh, for your partnership as board members in this work. And I thank you for your commitment to maintaining the integrity of uh, the district model of excellence process. I want to thank you also for the countless volunteer hours that you, you have listened to the concerns of family, students, and staff. And I thank you for representing all of the students in Hartford well. You are a board that brings voice to difficult questions with respect and a willingness to listen and to dialogue. This is going to push us to a better place and to improve our system and our structures on behalf of our students. So over the coming months, there will be a lot of discomfort. There will be disappointment. With you, I am committed to listening to people's fears and addressing their concerns while creating an equitable and sustainable model that serves all of our children and creates stability for our students, our staff, our schools, our families, and our neighborhoods. All of us at this table come to education with a love for our children, and we come to this work at this point with deep conviction around issues of equity and social justice. And so the work ahead of us, I believe, is a once in a lifetime opportunity to make transformational change in the way we educate our children in Hartford. And so the reason that there is so much stress when you think about transformational change 
I believe that is because we don't know what the outcome, what the final outcome is going to be. What we do know is that we can no longer stay where we are. We can no longer operate in this way. This process, I remind all of us that our children are watching and that I am proud that rather than taking sides against one another, we are remaining unified on the side of what is right and on the side of what is best for our children. And the message to our community here tonight, I wanna say to you that on behalf of our capable and beautiful students, I thank you for the work that we're going to collectively do together moving forward despite how challenging and discomfort it might be. I truly believe that we are one team, we are our team on behalf of our students. Thank you.
um, Hartford Public Schools had invited them to the table to talk about district priorities and um, the district model of excellence and how they can also support us and our community throughout this challenging transition. Um, I know that one of our speakers referenced the upcoming HPU Coalition Leadership Coalition event. That is a Harvard Public Schools and HPU uh, co-created uh, opportunity. It is a set of learning sessions that we are going to develop um, around continuous improvement culture um, for SGCs and PTOs. And the session on November 29th is to deepen the understanding of current student performance, uh, reveal uh, possible root cause, um, causes as to why it is that our students continue to perform uh, with challenges, and then also introduce <laughs> district priorities and strategies. We will do a follow-up session in January for parent leaders to discuss their role, the parents' role, and partnership in advancing the district strategies uh, for success around academic achievement. Lastly, I will reference uh, that the um, Welcome Center staff was honored at the Greater Hartford Children's Advocacy Center Gala. Um, Welcome Center staff uh, uh, had awards um, around the um, outstanding leadership for serving as leaders who care deeply about the health and well-being in our community uh, and their sharing of the resources with the community. So congratulations to Martha Bentham, <coughs> Judith Fagan. Um, they were honorees this year of their dedication of, to providing a wide array of uh, excellent opportunities for our families and children has been a, a great example and we honor and um, are grateful for their dedication. Uh, this concludes my report. Thank you, Madam Superintendent. Um, and the first committee report we have is Family Community Engagement. Mr. Flores. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the Family Community Engagement Committee met on November 8th. Uh, we went over the school <coughs> governance councils. We have been monitoring them as far as compliance is concerned. Uh, at this point, 20 of our SDCs are in full compliance and are operating effectively. Uh, we have 14 that are operating pretty well, but they still have some vacancies on them. And we have 11 that have five or more vacancies, and we have asked them to continue with the recruiting and election uh, process because we need them all to come up to speed. Uh, a question did come up specifically <laughs> on two schools that are being uh, phased out, the Capital College uh, Capital Community College Magnet School and the Culinary Arts Academy. Uh, their problem at this point, they just <clears throat> have very few students because they only have one or two years to go. So they only have one or two grades and they don't have enough population to fulfill the SGC requirements. Uh, they asked us if it was possible to get a waiver we checked with the State Department of Education and the answer that we got back is that there is no provision in the law to give waivers. The uh, composition of the SDCs is statutory. So we'll just have to work with them uh, with not being in compliance. They should do the best that they can. It's an issue that we probably will have to face in the future as we continue with our school closings and consolidations we will find that some schools, as they uh, wind down, will not have enough population to have 15 people on an SGC. But the State Department of Education has told us that as long as it is a school, it must have a separate SGC. Uh, <clears throat> we have a preliminary draft of policies on a review policies on roles, responsibilities of the SECs. Uh, at the next meeting, we will try to finalize that so we can present it to the policy committee. Uh, as we heard Ms. Taylor say last month, now we're trying to get each committee to work on the policies that affect their committees to uh, sort of lessen the workload of the policy committee, which is 
way too much for one committee to review all the policy every year. Uh, we had a discussion on the Weber High School uh, Steering Committee. Uh, we know that there's been a Weber High School Steering Committee and there's also a North Hartford Education Task Force. We have some misunderstandings as to how these groups worked and we did have a, a representative there who gave us a clear understanding uh, uh, of the two groups and what their function is. And then most of the meeting was dedicated to conversation at community schools. Last month, uh, the Hartford Partnership for Student Success held a community, a two community conversations on community schools. And I asked uh, Tohita Jackson, who's the executive director of the Hartford Partnership for Student <coughs> Success, to uh, make a presentation to the Family and Community Engagement Committee on uh, what's happening with community schools. Uh, a thing that we've heard is that we'd like eventually for every school to be thought of as a community school. Certainly the model that we have now is a very specific model uh, that is run by the Hartford Partnership, which is a partnership, not just Hartford Public Schools, but there's also uh, three other uh, community partners involved with us. Uh, there are also other schools that are not officially community schools, but have a lot of community resources in them. So we're talking about finding ways to look at the different schools and, and try to evaluate what their needs are. And even if we can't scale out the entire model to all of them, we can at least bring to them the resources that that school specifically needs. And we will continue working with uh, Ms. Jackson uh, on this in the future. And that concludes my report. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Flores. Uh, next, we have the policy committee. Okay, so good evening, community members. The policy committee last met on November 9th. Um, we had an update from Julie Wild, who is the assistant corporation counsel for the city of Hartford. She attended the policy committee meeting to update the committee on recent noncompliance issues and to share next steps. She provided a summary of non-compliance report and background overview of the voluntary action plan implications for our committee and a review of associated guidance, model policies, and resources. So we're looking at model policies from Shipman and Goodwin, also a neighboring district, and our own policies around harassment and looking to make modifications and revisions to that. Um, the committee is reviewing all of these related policies and we have an expected completion date for January 2018 for board approval. As many of you all know, uh, the policy committee was working on a draft policy that was going to undergird the work of our school consolidation, closure, co-location. Um, and we talked a little bit about that policy that we were initially drafting in comparison to uh, the process that we're undergoing at this present time. Michelle Pulick has, um, along with the superintendent, <coughs> cross-referenced our current policy, um, but also trying to kind of like lift out some of the safeguards that we have for community in the draft policy to incorporate into this current process. Uh, I think that our committee and our board as a whole really feels confident in the process that we're undergoing currently with the district model for excellence. Awesome. Um, we also talked about whether or not there would be a need for this policy in the future, whether or not we would revisit it. Um, I think that the consensus was the policy committee hopes that we won't ever have to undergo any situation and circumstance like the one that we are currently in. Um, so we have tabled that for now. Um, we also discussed the potential for additional policy implications uh, coming out of this process. Uh, things around transportation, potentially school choice, just things that we're we're hoping to kind of like illuminate through this process and maybe work on in the future because there will be policy implications that are going to emerge from our district model for excellence work in transitioning um, and going forward. We also talked uh, a little bit about what Mr. Julio referenced, um, kind of doling out some of the buckets of work to additional committees. So the committee discussed a proposal uh, for model policies approach, all board members and staff liaisons will be invited to a special meeting, date to be determined, to learn about the model policies and review the model policy process. Committees will be charged with reviewing current policies in their area and related model policies to determine any updates. Committees will be asked to pre present revised policies to the Board of Education Policy Committee as they are completed. 
a mid-year special meeting will be scheduled to check in with all of the committees. So we're gonna basically, um, in conjunction with the committee chairs and the liaisons, we're gonna talk about the buckets of work that will fall under, for instance, uh, choice and facilities or family and community engagement and figure out a working plan so that policy committee can be more of um, a clearinghouse for, these, for this work. Committees and the board will have the option to adopt individual model policies, modify and adopt, or simply use for reference while reviewing the current policies. Um, and we have a subscription to Shipman and Goodwin model policies that will help us in this work. Uh, the model policy approach sets an aggressive approach to reviewing and updating policies for legal compliance, content appropriateness, accountability, and implementation <laughs> processes and procedures. And if you all remember um, the action plan as related to the OCA report, these are things that we definitely need to work around in terms of like compliance and accountability. So I'm really excited about this work. I hope that you all are too, that you're gonna be getting your bucket of policy work. Um, and this concludes the policy committee report for this evening, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Taylor. Uh, thank you, Ms. Taylor. And next, we have School Choice and Facilities Committee. Ms. Flanagan. Thank you. Um, we met on November 13th. Um, <clears throat> we had um, a review of the then to date um, Weaver Educational Specifications, and which, um, it, it, which um, uh, parlayed into a discussion of the timeline for the board. Um, uh, voting on those educational specifications and whether or not that could be um, extended as long as it does not affect the construction and um, after after that meeting we, we received back information that it it um, would not affect construction uh, that, that, that the timeline can be extended to um, December or January as long um, without affecting construction um, as long as nothing in the educational specifications has any implications for like the physical space in the building um, so, um, we also discussed um, the kinds of things that would be reflected in these educational specifications and um, the, the idea that this is really sort of the, our, our vote on these when they come before us is the board's opportunity to um, sort of uh, put forward and be accountable to the community for our vision for Weaver, um, you know, obviously the, the building and also sort of um, how we envision the, the programming to be configured within the building. So. Um, those are the kinds of things that um, are going to be um, considered. Also, whether or not there should be um, uh, an executive principal was discussed. Um, there was so, and, and also for the process to be able to have a chance to be informed by the, the model for excellence and the learnings that we are um, currently finding, um, and the guiding principles that are emerging from our discussion and work on the model for excellence. So. Um, <clears throat> there will be one more working session in early December um, with the Weaver Steering Committee and the working groups and then um, all stakeholders um, will, will be given a, a timeline for like the absolute feedback on the educational specifications and as of, as of now I don't know the exact date for that but um, um, I will find out and let the board know and anybody else who wants to know. Um, there were some follow-up questions again on the Weaver um, educational specifications as to um, getting clarity, which we will also be getting and getting back to on exactly how many classes um, students from the other schools would be able to take in the, the magnet school, Kinsella, so that's something that we'll have to be getting um, clarification from the state on, and then once we get closer um, to to the, the school um, opening, we will we will actually run a mock schedule, and that will be something that we will look at in our committee. So um, we actually discussed having this um, this meeting actually net for next month in December is going to be on the 11th, which is actually going to be held right after the teaching and learning committee meeting. So um, that's that's going to be another opportunity to talk about um, the educational programming for Weaver and how it dovetails into these educational specifications. Um, we had a brief choice update. Um, the lottery season is underway. The Resco and the Hartford District Lottery opened on November 1st. They continue through February 28th. Um, the Resco First Choice Lottery application totals to date were um, 1,282, with a breakdown of 610 from Hartford and 672 Suburban. Uh, Hartford District First Choice Lottery application um, had a total of 95 applicants to date, and we were told um, that that is something that is uh, usually picks up later in the, the lottery process or still very early on. But the Hartford Choice Lottery doesn't um, 
typically experience as many applicants at this, this early on, so that's, that's a normal low number. Um, and the choice staff are conducting outreach and um, recruiting and application assistance sessions um, to support families throughout this process. We also had an update on the placement of displaced families, which the superintendent spoke to um, in her report. And then finally, we had um, uh, an MLK update. Um, there was discussion um, that there had been some concern over how MLK was presented in the choice brochure and other marketing materials throughout the choice process. So we're um, looking into that and, and continuing to get feedback on that and learn from, from those concerns. Sorry, lastly, we <laughs> that wasn't the last thing. We had a discussion <laughs> of the, um, the process for um, the district submitting the um, certifications for, um, what are they called? They're called action item, uh, the certifications for completion of projects to the building committee. Um, it's a form, but um, there's a protocol around that that um, is in place and we had a review of it so that we are sure that we are actually submitting um, our um, certification that our projects are complete so that people can be paid um, and these projects can be closed out. And that completes my choice report, choice and facilities report. Thank you, Ms. Glenville. Uh, and next we have um, teaching and learning committee report, Mr. Coto. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, the Teaching and Learning Committee met on November 6th um, on a Monday. Uh, Juan Hernandez was there. Um, Kate England was there, our Chief Academic Officer, um, including members of our team, and Christina Santiago was also there. Um, just a quick, <coughs> quick overview of what we talked about. Uh, we talked about the district's planning process of um, creating a common curriculum in math and literacy for all grades, and also talking about how that's being implemented, um, you know, from from one grade to the next. Um, pretty much across the district, the lower grades curriculum in math and literacy uh, should be rolled out, should be implemented at this point, and we're kind of making our way up in terms of the the, the grade levels, in terms of implementing the curriculum. Um, and just to give you some background, the, the district. Um, for many years did not really have like a common curriculum or learning plan for all schools in the district and so in recent years um, there's been more planning on the district's part to really talk about you know what's the plan what's the learning goals what sort of knowledge do we want um, students in all schools to know and give uh, teachers and principals a plan of what that looks like um, so that's that's what this kind of co committee is looking at right now is that that sort of implementation um, Sounds a little bit dry and boring, but it's actually pretty important to think about that the core business of a district is um, to think about what students are learning, the knowledge that they're gaining, and the types of skills that they're getting. Um, also, just a little bit of background, uh, 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 Chairman Stallings and I had asked specifically to what extent is the curricula, are the curricula that are being offered or, or, or demonstrated here, um, do they have cur culturally relevant uh, books, materials, and also lesson plans? And we did see some examples of materials and books uh, that, are be that are being used in conjunction with this rollout of the curriculum um, and what those look like, particularly at the younger grades. Um, so we saw books that have kids and families that look like us, basically. So uh, that's, that's important for, for us as board members. Um, secondly, we looked at the drafting of something called the whole student framework, um, which talks about um, just guidelines about how the schools are supposed to um, kind of take students in as whole students and also address uh, their kind of non-learning needs like social emotional learning uh, but that's a draft and so we'll continue to work on that and then finally uh, our next meeting if folks are interested is it's a monday morning bright and early uh, 8 30 a.m at the, the school board office and we'll be looking at um, how the district um, manages data about what students know and they're able to do. So in other words, there's this like online management system uh, that's supposed to kind of give us an idea of how our students are doing <coughs> in each grade at each school um, in different subject areas. And so we'll take a look at that and, and I guess kind of look under the hood a little bit to see how that works. Um, so join us if you are interested. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Koto. <laughs> and um, last is the Finance Audit Committee 
Uh, I don't have a report because um, we don't meet, we meet uh, quarterly mostly. But what I would like to say simply is, um, though the work is not sexy, as you can see, we're working hard. Um, we are setting the table to make sure that we have an effective district that is going to, <laughs> you guys are laughing, but it's true, it's not the kind of thing that people um, are necessarily interested in, but these technical things that we're doing are, are steps to move this, the district in the direction that we want it to go. And what we want is quality education in our district, and we want our families to be happy, we want our children to be educated, and we want our children safe in our schools. So uh, I just want to conclude all the committee reports and want to thank the entire board for all of oh, you. Have, you have a report? I didn't have, oh, I don't have, I do have it, number four. Forgive me. You know, we should make that like number three. Um, student voice, Alexa, please forgive me and um, proceed. On November 14th, the Student Senate met with Baran, who is a community organizer for racial and economic justice. His organization is from my classroom to my colleague, which is trying to increase the number of minority teachers in Hartford. He is trying to help increase student voice and student activism by creating a diverse student body that will advocate for more Latino and African American teachers. All members of the Student Senate are very interested in joining and starting a policy agenda that will benefit our community and our school system. We all agree that having a diverse body of teachers, staff, and guidance counselors helps us to form strong body, bonds and feel a sense of belonging and school connectedness. After meeting with Veron, the Student Senate decided to take part in the Trinity Hip Hop Festival. This will be our second year participating in the festival. Last year, we had a great time representing the Hartford Public Schools and informing students and parents of their rights, along with handing out information for those who would like to become a citizen or who would like to help with immigrants. This year, we are excited to do this again and be voices at the festival. We have many ideas on what to advocate for this year. Such ideas include Puerto Rican aid, and or student involvement. In addition, the Student Senate also shared ideas on ways we can volunteer in the community. Two, two ideas were to raise money for kids in hospitals and to do something with them on Valent Valentine's Day or plant trees on Earth Day. At our next meeting, we'll, we will vote on these ideas. Thank you for allowing me to share a summary of our meeting. You're very welcome. You're very welcome. Forgive me for forgetting. All right. Um, moving on to the business agenda. Um, item of order of importance. Item number one: contract approval. Image Associates, seventy-seven thousand three hundred. Um, this contract addendum supports the continuation of multiple communication projects aligned with the Harper Public Schools District Improvement Plan. This contract is fully funded by supplemental funds to the district level to the district level system. Excuse me, hold on, I'm tongue tied. To the district level systems change grant from the Nellie May Education Fund Foundation. The funds support communication and engagement work associated with implementing the HPS strategic operating plan, specifically putting students at the center of their learning and families and community partner, partnerships. Through this funding, uh, the Nellie May uh, Educational Foundation provides professional communication support and services of the Image Association Associates to create family and community learning modules. Forgive me. And webinar, webinars and student-centered learning communication materials, translations and planning and development services uh, for the Harford service, excuse me, for Harford Public Schools. As specific in this grant, Image Associates was awarded this contract as technical assistant uh, through the R RFQ, uh, Request for Qualification Bid, by the Nellie May uh, Education Foundation. The Harford Board of Education authorizes the superintendent to execute the contract addendum with Image Associates according to the agreement upon grant guidelines ending June 30th, 2018, at a cost not to exceed $77,300. Madam Superintendent. I just want to add to your background, uh, Chairman Spellings, that this work uh, will supplement the day-to-day <coughs> district-wide communications work, such as website and internet um, development maintenance and ongoing district-wide communications, media relations and issues management, 
um, all, of course, directly connected to the district level systems change work. Uh, you, you referenced the fact that um, this is part of the Nellie Mae Education Foundation grant. Um, Image Associates is the sole uh, technical assistance provider for communication support to the Nellie Mae Foundation's uh, district level systems change grantees, uh, including the Harper Public Schools. And so, um, again, making sure that we understand that the contract uh, for Image Associates was awarded through a competitive uh, request for qualifications uh, process. All right, thank you, uh, Madam Superintendent. Is there a motion to approve this item? Mm -hmm. Is there a second? Second. It's been mo it's moved and seconded. All in favor? Aye. All opposed? The ayes have it. Uh, moving on to the second item. It's the second reading and adoption of the willingness policy 6142.101. Um, the policy committee, the Harper Board of Education, accepts the second reading and adopts the willingness policy um, 6142.101. Dot 101. Um, Madam Superintendent, do you want to say anything? Uh, no. Uh, no. Uh, no, no, I was going to. I just wanted to give you. Thank you. She was, she was getting paid as well. I was stolen. Got it. Miss Taylor. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so, <laughs> but we did our we did our first read on the wellness policy, um, and we really did lift out that this is a policy that is going to address um, really like the whole child approach. So we're talking about nutrition, we're talking about social and emotional behavior, we're talking about physical activity, um, and I believe that at the first read, folks were really just thrilled and impressed that we had all of these elements included in the policy that spoke to the whole child wellness. Um, I guess if you, if any of the board members have questions, I'm happy to answer them, or if they have input or feedback around this policy, I'm happy to answer, but otherwise we will adopt this evening, which is really exciting for the policy committee that does lots of work, but doesn't seem to <laughs> adopt many policies, unfortunately. I'm so excited. I open up to questions or comments. Is there any questions or comments on this motion? Hearing none, uh, is there a motion? So moved. It's moved, is it second? Second. It's been moved and seconded, all in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? The eyes had it. Um, exciting, exciting, exciting. Um, consent agenda. Is there a motion to take the consent agenda off as one item? So moved. Has it been moved? Is there a second? Second. It's been moved and seconded, so we're going to take the consent agenda up as one item. All in favor of supporting the consent agenda? So moved. So moved. Is there a second? Second. All in favor? Say aye. 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 All opposed? Eyes have it, consent agenda has been uh, passed and approved. And is there a motion for adjournment? So moved. So moved, is there a second? Second. Any debate? Any any questions? Happy All, in <laughs> All in favor of adjournment? Aye. Aye. As opposed? No. Thank you. We're adjourned. Saludos, estoy orgullosa de ser su superintendente, la doctora Leslie Torres Rodríguez. Estoy dirigiendo el proceso crucial de reimaginar y reestructurar nuestro distrito escolar. Necesito que ustedes, todos ustedes, tengan una participación significativa en nuestro proceso. Estamos haciendo esta labor crucial para cumplir nuestro compromiso, garantizar mejores resultados para los estudiantes y un acceso equitativo a los recursos para todos y cada uno de nuestros estudiantes hermosos y competentes. Cuando hayamos completado este proceso juntos, tendremos en nuestras manos un distrito escolar más fuerte y más equitativo diseñado para servir bien a todos los estudiantes y un plan construido por toda la comunidad para el beneficio de toda la comunidad. Nosotros en las escuelas públicas de Hartford estamos coordinando este proceso, pero ustedes, la comunidad, las familias, los estudiantes, los maestros y todos nuestros socios son las voces y las mentes que orientan este trabajo. Al compartir sus opiniones, ustedes ayudarán a crear nuestro modelo del distrito. Nuestro trabajo en conjunto que se llevará a cabo durante los próximos meses en reuniones comunitarias con familias, socios y escuelas, culminará 
con la presentación de recomendaciones para modelos de excelencia del distrito. Estos modelos demostrarán diferentes maneras en que el distrito puede ser reimaginado tomando en consideración la condición y viabilidad de nuestros vecindarios y garantizando el acceso continuo de oportunidades y servicios a nuestras familias y estudiantes. Para obtener más noticias sobre este proceso, visite nuestra página del web del distrito en el www.hartfordschools.org.